I'm here to talk about uh, scalable machine learning setups for uh, empowering payments by smart routing. And uh, before that, let me introduce myself. So I'm Pranjal. I have spent about eight years uh, in the AI industry working with big tech companies across India, uh, UK, and Canada. And I was lucky enough to start my own company called Alpha Hub, which was a no-code deep learning research platform uh, for uh, students. And uh, currently, I'm working with Razor Pay uh, in the capacity of a staff engineer, and I'm handling all ML and ML ops cases. So, um, let me present the agenda of this uh, talk. Right, I have four things to achieve today. First is, of course, I'm going to pitch my employer, because why not, right? And uh, then I'm going to talk about what is a payment gateway, and it's my job to ensure that everybody in this room understands what payment gateway does. Third thing is, I'll talk about how a machine learning setup or a simple use of data can empower a thing as simple as a payment gateway. And fourth, I'll talk about how Redis sits at the center of all this, and it's not just helping us deliver all this, but opening new doors for us. So these are the four key points and I try my best to ensure that all this is covered and everybody leaves uh, with these questions answered by the end of the talk. Are you with me on this? Yeah. Cool. So, Razorpay, right? Uh, I just want to show off hands, uh, who doesn't know Razorpay in this room? Fine. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> So, uh, uh, our vision is that we want to be a one-stop solution for business uh, finance, right? And when I say that, uh, we want to provide a business finance ecosystem for a merchant who's just starting to mid-tier merchants to even enterprise clients, right? And that's what we are. And we largely have three businesses or three verticals, so to say. Uh, the first one is called Payments Gateway, which is the bread and butter for the company and is where we started as well. And it has a bunch of solutions, right? So the very first you'll see is a payment gateway. Then we have something called as an, a token at HQ, which is a tokenization service on top of card data, which is in compliance with the RBI guidelines and whatnot. And there are multiple other products in that vertical. Then there is Razorpay Capital, which is purely around lending. So you have instant settlements, you have loans, you have corporate cards, etc. in that vertical. And then we have Razorpay X, which is uh, basically a new banking service, right? So anything you can imagine from a new bank, it's served there. And of course, all of this is powered by our treasury. So that's there as well. So this is uh, our setup in terms of how we operate as a uh, business, right? Uh, let's look at what people like you and others feel about Razorpay. So we've been doing pretty well. Uh, we are valued at $7.5 billion and uh, we recently got our PAPG license and that's a big deal. We were also listed in uh, one of the best private cloud companies by Forbes and we were the only Indian company to make it. So that was uh, really uh, good. And uh, we made two major acquisitions this year. One was EasyTap, uh, which essentially is powering our offline sales. So that is very important to us. And second is Poshwine. Poshwine is our loyalty reward management service. So with Poshwine and EasyTap, and earlier we acquired Curlec in Malaysia, which helps us with our recurring uh, payments or subscription services. And there is IZLint in Pune. We are a 3,000 plus member community now, and we are very happy. So yeah, that's Razor Pay. Uh, going back, so actually let's go back and look at this slide. Uh, on the top left in the payment stack, there is something called a payment gateway. And that is what I promised to explain you in the second point, right? So let's try and understand what a payment gateway is. And I'll try to simplify it to a degree that, you know, it's obvious to you. I think of payment gateway as the modern money movement mechanism, right? This is how you move money in general. So let's take a very simple example. You are a customer, you go to Swiggy or uh, uh, Amazon, right? And you want to place an order. You select something and you click on that payment button. Swiggy or Amazon will come and tell Razorpay, hey, there's a payment from this, uh, from this customer that I need you to handle for me. Razorpay will make a request to the bank. Now, the, the step which says confirm payment is very simple, but it has numerous steps within it. But uh, we'll talk about that, of course. But after that, what happens is just a response, right? The bank says yes or no, the payment happened or not. And the same feedback is relayed to you. Uh, first, the gateway receives it, then the merchant receives it, and then you receive it uh, on your uh, device, right? And there is something called a payout because if we are processing payments on behalf of Swiggy or Amazon, we have to pay them back as well, right? And that's called reconciliation. Anyhow, so our focus right now is this confirm payment step, right? This is essentially what this payment gateway is powering. So let's try and zoom into that step, right? There are 
actually more than two dozen steps that happen within that uh, one arrow, but we'll, we are interested in four. The first one is authentication and authorization, and that's pretty obvious, right? It's, it's, it's nothing I'm, like new, and that's a security layer. Second is matching an incoming request to the right API or the right service. So in India, largely you would hear that there are four modes of payment, which is UPI, cards, net banking, and wallets, right? Uh, mapping the request to the correct service is critical for the success of that incoming payment. So that happens. The third point, which is choosing the best terminal is where all the machine learning magic happens. But there's a term called terminal, right? And that's not obvious to everyone. So let me define it. And again, I'm simplifying it by a lot. So don't take me for my word, but I'm trying to help you understand it. Terminal is a piece of code sitting on one of the servers within a bank. What it does is, when you send a request and say, I want to pay this 100 rupees, and it eventually reaches that code, it says, okay, this person's credit account or debit account has this much money, and I'm going to deduct that and send the response. That is a terminal in a very simple manner, right? So if a payment comes and says, I have these 10 options of terminals, you choose it for me. And you tell me where I'm going to be the most successful. The chances of success are high. That's where machine learning is required. And that's where ML adds the power. So we'll discuss step number three in great detail. And step number four is simple, right? If you know the terminal that's going to give you the best likelihood of success, you just execute it, right? And then you wait for uh, what happens next. So, so far you're with me, right? These four steps are pretty simple, correct? Okay. Now we are going to look at it from a system design perspective, right? If you are an architect, how will you execute these four steps in a system, right? So this is a, again a very trimmed down version. Um, the first thing is you receive a valid request. You send it to something called a router, right? And every service will have a router in some shape and form. You may or may not call it a router, but whatever routes your incoming traffic is a router, right? So you will have a router and that will largely decide where this request needs to go. Is it a UPI payment or is it a card payment or whatever? Then there is this box called Doppler. Now Doppler is the machine learning engine at Razorpay, which powers all of our payments, right? And it has two purposes. One is deciding the best terminal for a payment, which is what we just saw. And second is recording a feedback as to what happened with the payment. Because let's say you come and ask me, Pranjal, will this work? And I tell you, yes. I need to know from you, did it work, right? So that feedback is critical. So in this setup, we are, Rough, doing roughly 10 to 50 million transactions a day, right? So the cost of being wrong is very, very high, right? And we have to manage that. Second thing is, uh, in this diagram, you're seeing roughly five hops. So let's go through the journey, right? Step number two, router calls Doppler. Doppler receives some feedback. It's, it's a historical data from the most recent history that we are using as feature. So Redis is basically being a feature store for us in step number three. And there are a few other stores, so I have not highlighted that, but we are taking input. And then fourth step is nothing but prediction, right? It's giving a sorted list of terminals, which one will work in, in that order. Router then says, okay, let me try and execute. So it just talks to external banks or other networks. And then within there, there are a lot of hops that happens, but let's not go there. And then six, seven, eight is nothing but feedback. And we have to record feedback at each layer to measure the success of each component. So that happens, right? And in all this, step number three and step number eight is the most critical. Not just for ML because again, uh, this is where we use Redis the most, right? As a feature store and as a feedback store. Uh, so far so good? Cool. So uh, now let's try and understand why Redis, right? Until April this year, we were happily using Postgres. It's a relational store most of us would be using it in our daily use cases, right? So what changed? Well, a few things. Uh, our business expanded exponentially, uh, moving from 50 to 100 transactions per second to let's say 800 to 1000 transactions per second. And we are ambitious to grow to 2000 or 3000 transactions per second by next year, right? So at that scale, uh, it's a very simple problem in engineering. You, you start incurring tech debt and you have to pay for it, right? So Postgres was not able to handle our requirements beyond a point. And that's what happened and that's what we identified and we moved to Redis. Now again, what is so smart about moving from a relational store to uh, in-memory storage, right? It solves your speed issues. That's pretty obvious, right? 
But let's try and understand what is the cost of understanding and executing the obvious. So here is where we are kind of moving from step three, which is using machine learning to power a payment gateway to use cases of Redis with machine learning. I'm not diving deeper into Doppler as a system, but I'm happy to talk about it later outside uh, after, after the talk. So let's try and understand uh, the setup, uh, yeah, before and after. Postgres again, slow reads is obvious. IO locks, what happens if you are there and you have a payment button and you press it three times? I may end up duplicating that payment three times and then I'll have to worry about paying you back two times. So what we were doing was we were kind of using a hash code with the payment ID to make sure that we only insert one record and for that we were upserting into our Postgres database and that creates an IO lock, right? And you have to wait for the lock to get uh, resolved. That then in turn creates scaling issues. So non-peak times, 200 requests, fine. IPL time, 800 requests, not great, right? So we were scaling tremendously and losing a lot of money in scale, right? And we were not utilizing our, uh, all the things that we were paying for. And last, the unpredictability, right? If our customers feel that Razorpay as a payment gateway is not reliable, that's bad. Right? So all these problems were coming from the very simple fact that our feedback was not at par with our requirement in terms of speed and reliability. So that's where we moved to Redis. And if you look at you know, the number of features that Redis provides you as an enterprise solution, it's huge, it's endless, it's like 150 plus things. But in the next slide, let me bring up the top eight that I feel were most important in making this decision happen, right? So of course, payments, right? So asset compliance and durability is super obvious. And uh, you might wonder like uh, linear scaling or uh, high availability is what I would be uh, looking forward to, but no. I actually was very enticed by the total cost of ownership and multi-tenancy. I'll tell you why. In this setup, if I have one cluster for my feedback, it is super, super easy and convenient for me to have another one in pure isolation on this, within the same service for a secondary feedback or for a secondary feature service and anything like that. So I can literally exhaust the last bit of my physical resource before paying for something else. And that is what multi-tenancy allows me. And that's something that we covered in the keynote as well, right? And that, that gives me the comfort of finding the right balance between cost and operations and providing all the guarantees that I have to do as a business, right? So these two are my favorite and then we debated on probably a two dozen other features and we decided that, yeah, this is the way forward. So yeah, sounds good, everything nice, move from relational to in-memory storage, but what happened? What was the impact? And was it even measured over the good duration? Yes. Here I'm presenting the impact, which is measured over a span of six months uh, from April onwards. And it has multiple peaks like IPL, uh, World Cup, um, other major events like Big Billion Day and whatnot, right? So it is it has stood the test of time. Now let's look at the numbers, right? And they speak for themselves. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing. In model inference, it is not the time that step three from the feature store to model is all about, right? This time is not just that, it has a few other layers to it. Uh, we are reading from some other data points of some other streaming services as well. But largely it is that number. So if you see uh, non-peak performance, we have moved from 100 millisecond plus on average in model inference to less than 10 milliseconds. And at peak we have moved from, let's say 300 milliseconds was the average to less than 100 milliseconds. And if you look at the feedback storage time, the time it takes to store a success or a failure. At peak, it was 800 milliseconds and sometimes the service would go down because it was crossed the one second mark and we are under 20 milliseconds. So there is 50 to 70 X improvement in storage and 10 to five X improvement in our inference layer, right? And uh, this, is, this is very powerful if you think about it. Let's say I have an SLA of 300 millisecond for, to process the payment. Right? And I was spending 150 milliseconds in just moving data here and there. It's very, very expensive. But the moment all that happens under 10 seconds, now I have an additional 140 millisecond, uh, uh, 10 milliseconds. I have an additional 140 milliseconds to do more in data science. So I'll tell you, we were using models that were trained on a regular basis and they would get refreshed at a non-peak hour. 
and they would function nicely. Now, with this improved availability of time, I have the capacity to launch bandits, which are nothing but continuously learning algorithms in production, right? And then it reduces a lot of ML ops uh, problems that people incur usually over the span of uh, an ML journey. So I can do that, and that door was opened by just this very simple and obvious transition. But that was not even the you know expected outcome. It is a side outcome which empowers us to do more, right? And uh, with that, I would like to conclude the four points that I was here for, uh, which is talking about the payment gateway and trying to add ML into it and trying to kind of talk about how Redis is helping it. But let me step a little ahead and talk about the roadmap because there was a few things pointed out in the keynote that we are also trying to achieve. You heard about visual search, right? Uh, visual search is obvious because if you think about audio data or uh, image data, right, it makes sense. We are trying to invent the same thing, but for fraud and risk, right? So if you think of fraud and risk patterns with respect to time in a chronological fashion, and you vectorize that space, I am, what we are trying to do is find similar uh, vectors in our database to look for uh, fraud and anomalies so that we can proactively detect, detect them. So that is one strong use case and we are building the definition of similarity in-house. So that's a bespoke thing, but you heard something very similar and it, I was very happy to hear that because it makes sense, right? Having something like a vector which represents something and being able to augment that vector to your need during the search only is very, very powerful. Second use case is something that we, uh, we achieved with huge success is DDoS attacks. Uh, we, did, we recently kind of presented a dynamic rate limiting system, which uh, we developed uh, using Redis and a few other uh, streaming services in-house uh, to stop DDoS attacks. And it uses the same pattern. It relies heavily on the fact that we need low latency, high availability services. And Redis was able to power that. So we were able to create this system which continuously updates a rate limit at multiple layers. It could be at a route layer, it could be at an API layer, it could be for a merchant, it could be for anything. And the scale is practical because you have something like Redis as a store which basically gives you some millisecond response times, right? So that was the second use case and I saw that was also touched upon in the keynote and I again felt aligned and happy that uh, the industry is moving in the same direction. Uh, so yeah, that is the roadmap we have. We are investing heavily in uh, let's say inventing the risk and fraud detection 2.0 for the fintech industry. And while doing that, of course, we'd love to collaborate more and more with Redis. And that's where I'd like to end the talk. So thank you so much.